it out. And this is actually a real question here, that a real learning catalytics question, which I'm going to launch here in a second. So up there at the top is the session ID. Once you log in once here with our, there's our session ID number. Um, once you log in with that, you should it makes it easier to log in in the subsequent times. And though, don't take it, if, if you're not doing it today, don't worry about writing this number down because this is going to be specific. Oh, I logged out. Hold on just a second. So um, this will be specific to this session. And so we're all, we're all kind of testing this out here today. I'm working on it as well. Uh, let me zoom back out so you can see the question here. Sorry. Now, everybody could be working on this. Uh, if you're not doing learning analytics today, you can use the, uh, the hand signals in just a second. Don't put your hands down. Go ahead and read over everything. All right. Uh, I am launching the question. Okay. So for those of you who are doing learning catalytics, it looks like there's about 85 of you, almost 100 people on right now, which is great. So this question is now active. And um, so you can go ahead and enter your answer. For everybody who's not doing learning catalytics today, again, don't worry. You're not missing any points. But go ahead and think about your answer. Keep your hands down for now. And we'll all vote on this in a moment. So I'm going to give you a few seconds now once we're up and running. I saw a question in the chat. Oh, how do we get there from, from mastering biology? There's a link. You have to scroll down. It's not right up near the top, but there's a link to learning catalytics up near the top there. All right. So giving everybody a little bit more chance here to uh, see how we're doing. Okay. Good. Good. I still see the number of act of users uh, right now sort of creeping up. So we'll spend a little bit more time. This will, this will get easier as we go on. Everyone will be a little bit more used to logging in and, and doing this and everything. So usually we won't spend this much time on any particular questions, but we're spending a little extra time right now. All right. So again, don't worry if you haven't, if you're still in the login process, I'm going to ask another question in just a second. But let's, let's move on for this one. So we've got carbon, we're thinking about photosynthesis here, right? We have CO2 which is represents carbon in an oxidized state. And then here we have glucose, which represents carbon in a, in a reduced state, right? And so which of the, uh, yeah, you can do it by hand signals right now, or I see your, your results if you did it on learning catalytics. What do you think is the best answer? Go ahead and hand up for those of you who don't have learning catalytics today. What do you like? All right. Okay, so I'm seeing mostly people going with this one here uh, with B, which is correct. And that's also was the, you know, about 60% of people went with that one on learning catalytics as well. So um, and that's the correct answer, right? So the light reaction is basically where we're sort of harvesting energy, right? In the chloroplast, we're, we're ta taking in photons of light and we're making, uh, you know, AT, we're converting that into ATP and electron sources. And then in the Calvin cycle, that is used to create this high energy molecule here, the, the glucose. So, you know, we have uh, NADPH, that's the molecule that stores electrons, right? That's going to be oxidized to NADP plus. And then at the same time, this also requires an investment of, of chemical energy in the form of ATP. So we have ATP plus water getting hydrolyzed to ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. And so we're creating this high energy molecule from these very cheap atmospheric carbon dioxides. All right, so just wanted to remind you, we're gonna focus, we're not really gonna talk at all about the light reaction. Our focus is gonna be on the Calvin cycle from here on out, but I wanted you to think a little bit about what the contribution of the light reaction is. All right, now here's another question. So this is, I'm gonna uh, get to the next question here. Um, 
if so by me. So you can read this over on the, uh, oh yeah. There we go. Okay, so this question is up and running here now too. Now this is also kind of a review of some 161. Oh yeah, and by the way, I just added this last night so it's not in your worksheets or something. Sorry about that. I'm gonna try, most of the stuff you need is gonna be in the worksheets. But this you'll just have to, uh, you can add on somewhere there. So an enzyme can catalyze two distinct reactions. Now that's already kind of weird. When you think about bio 161, right? You thought about enzymes being highly specific. They're thinking about their active site of an enzyme. It's highly specific to its substrate. But here's a case of an enzyme. They can actually use two different molecules as, as substrate. We're gonna call them A and B for right now. So we have two distinct reactions, one using reactant A as a substrate and one using reactant B as a substrate. And so they both have two distinct products. The enzyme's affinity for reactant A is about 10 times higher than its affinity for reactant B. So under which of the following conditions, I've got some concentrations there, it might be kind of hard, the barriers might make it kind of hard to see that. So um, then you can select all that apply, but under which of these conditions would we favor the production of product B? So go ahead and, you know, depending on your style, think about this yourself for a moment. Uh, if you want to, you know, share it with your notebook, that's fine. If you want to talk to somebody next to you about your answer, go ahead. But uh, you can also um, go ahead and put this in learning catalytics too, if you are thinking about it here. So under which of these conditions would we expect synthesis of product B to be favored? All right. Good. Those of you who are, are talk, saying this out loud to people next to you, that's great. Um, all right. So if you don't have learning context, I see what the answers are here. Um, you can use your hand for this also. We have four possible answers. So anywhere between one and four answers could be correct. Just with a your show of fingers, tell me how many, how many choices up there would you click if you could click on them? Would you do one or two or three or four? Would you like this? Go ahead. Pick your up and see. All right, here in the audience, I'm seeing mostly ones and a few twos. And looking at learning catalytics, it looks like um, almost everybody picked D. Actually, in fact, 100% went for D, which is correct. Um, a lot of people went for B. What's wrong with what's wrong with B? Why is B not a good answer choice? I just said that. Why is try and talk, try and explain to your neighbor why is B a bad answer choice or a correct answer choice for this question? All right, great. Somebody, what, what, share what you were talking about. What's wrong with the B? Somebody over here. What's, what's wrong with like B as an answer to it? Yeah, go ahead. There's a question that A that would be a good chance of the A versus the Right, really good. So let me repeat that. And you do have to do a little math for this, all right? So it's based on that statement about the affinity. Right, the affinity is 10 times higher for A. So you do have to like, you know, you can take reactant A down there and, and so looking at line B, um, we can take reactant A, we kind of have to multiply that by 10, right? To, to give us the chance that that enzyme is going to interact with it. I mean, what do, what do we mean by affinity? That's a really important word for bio-162. So can somebody can you define when we talk about an enzyme's affinity, what do we mean by that? You have a good definition? Yeah, go ahead. Great, yeah, how well the enzyme holds on to the substrate to modify it, right? These are all chemicals that have shapes and, and so there's gonna be interactions between the protein and those chemicals and, and you know, because of hydrogen bonds or Van der Waal forces or other like molecular forces, some are gonna you know, stick to the enzyme's active site a little bit better than others. And anyway, so that's, so D is really the only answer here that, that in which reaction product B would be favored. Now, why did I ask you this question? First of all, it's like, 
reviewing a little bit about enzyme activity. You have to talk about affinity a little bit. You have to do a little bit of you know, easy math to kind of think through the question. And also this is very relevant to something that's gonna come up a little bit later in the, in the question. So um, we're gonna talk a bit more now. So if you wanna put your uh, device, uh, you can put your device away, but we will be doing some more learning catalytics questions a little bit later. Um, let me see here. Okay. So I started, we, now let's, let's think here a little, little bit. Now here we are on the worksheets. And um, what I want you to do is, is leave this space over here empty. Don't write anything there. We're gonna use that in a, in a moment, okay? Um, but over here, we're just gonna think about the Calvin cycle and review some stuff. So uh, of course the, the key element of the Calvin cycle is that we're taking in carbon dioxide from the environment. And that gets combined with a five carbon molecule called ribulose bisphosphate, RUBP. So the C5 underneath there just tells us, okay, this is a, mo a sugar molecule, you know, made up that has five carbons. And so it's going to combine with that carbon dioxide. So that gives us a six carbon molecule, which right away is broken into two, three carbon molecules. That's what we see happening over here. All right. Um, pencil in the name of the enzyme that, that catalyzes this reaction. Sometimes, sometimes called the most important enzyme on earth. I think you can make an argument for that. Certainly also considered the most abundant enzyme on earth. Um, and this one is the Rubisco enzyme, right? So. Now, Rubisco, remember, that's just an abbreviation for a really long term, ribulose, bisphosphate, carboxylase, oxygenase, but you don't need to do that, right? So Rubisco is the enzyme that catalyzes this, what we call the fixation step, right, of, of the Calvin cycle. Okay, then next we, now here comes the, what's called the reduction step. And this is where uh, we're gonna use up ATP and NADPH. here in the reduction step. And that makes this molecule called, a three carbon molecule called glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And one of the things that that can be used to, well, what that is used to make, some of it at least, is pulled out to make uh, glucose. But most of it, actually like about 80% of the glyceraldehyde three phosphate that's made is used to regenerate that ribulose bisphosphate. So here's the regeneration step here. Uh, so it's a series of enzymatic steps where that ribulose, bis the, the, the glyceraldehyde three phosphate is used to regenerate the ribulose bisphosphate so the whole cycle can continue. But some of it gets pulled out to use for glucose. Maybe you can think about this too as a good review. What is the plant, what are some of the things that the plant does with that glucose? So we've made glucose during the Calvin cycle. What's, what's a future destination for that glucose in a typical plant cell? Yeah. Yes, glycolysis, right? That, I mean, plant cells have mitochondria, just like ours, think about a root, right? You think about well, plants, you think photosynthesis, which is good, but you know, there's lots of cells in the plant that can't do photosynthesis and they still need to make ATP and they do it the same way our cells do. Through uh, it's broken down in the mitochondria through glycolysis. Great. What's another possible? Yeah. Cell wall. Cell wall, which is made of somebody else. Just say it out loud. Right. Cellulose. And if we, if the plant wants to store that glucose for use later, what's the molecule? Everybody. Right. Good starch. Right. So this could be used to make. You know. So it could be for uh, glycolysis. Starch. For storage. Or the plant can use it to build its own body, right, as, as cellulose. And of course, we derive energy from this as well, right? We, when you eat an apple, you're essentially eating solar energy that's been converted into chemical energy. Um, and so we're either, you know, almost all of our calories are derived from this process, right? Either because we're eating plants or we're eating animals that ate plants, right? So one way or another, that's where our energy is coming from. Okay, good. So any questions about this review here of Calvin cycle before we move on? Okay. So uh, I taught Bio 161 for a bunch of years. And I have to say, like if you come out of Bio 161, you have sort of a, a rosy kind of pie in the sky view of photosynthesis, right? You're like, oh, it's so nice. The sun shines on the plant, the plant harvests the energy and it uses it to make its own food. 
and everything is great, right? But now I'm here to tell you that that, that picture of photosynthesis is actually not very accurate because photosynthesis is really, really hard and it creates some serious challenges for plants, which are kind of represented here in these cartoons. Um, so the one up at the top here represents the photosynthesis that most plants do, including my little orchids down here. Most plants do what is called C3 photosynthesis. So when you learn about photosynthesis in Bio 161, this is what you learned about, C3 photosynthesis. And here it's represented by this, this uh, little worker here in this factory. Now, her machine uh, that allows her to work is solar powered. So she can only work when the sun is shining. And so you can see she's like hot and uncomfortable and sweaty because she's standing there. And she can only work under the bright sunlight of, of day. She also has another problem, which is her supply chain is really screwed up, just like the rest of us, right? Her supply chain is messed up. Um, and you can see, like, here's the product over here. This is what she's trying to make. So this is like her, you know, that's her desired product of her factory. But because she's got all of these different products coming in on her supply line, she's grabbing them off the, the, the conveyor belt there. She's making a lot of these waste products that then have to be deassembled later or recycled in some way or something like that. So this is the picture you should have of photosynthesis the way most plants do it, right? So here we're talking about most plants on Earth do C3 photosynthesis, and it is hot and uncomfortable and wasteful for the plant. And so what we're going to think about is what exactly are those challenges of photosynthesis and how have some plants evolved solutions to those? Now, the, the, the cartoons below here refer to some of these solutions that have evolved. And I'll probably make this in a little follow-up assignment where you're gonna look at these cartoons more carefully and see if you can link them up to things that we'll talk about here in lecture. All right. Um, so the challenges of photosynthesis, what are they? Number one is water loss. Losing water to the environment. Okay, so here we, we have to think a little bit about some plant anatomy here. So here what we have is a cross section of a leaf um, and the part that I've already drawn in on your worksheets are the, the epidermal cells. The epidermal cells. And one thing that these cells do is that they synthesize and secrete uh, wax. So they have sort of a waxy layer on the surface. Here, just real quick, think about wax for a second. Think back to 161. Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Wax, hydrophilic. Hydrophobic. Everybody go ahead, put your hand up. Hydrophilic or hydrophobic? What do you like? Okay, good. I'm seeing a lot of hydrophobics right here. So wax is hydrophobic. And so it does create a nice barrier for water uh, escaping, right? So the water, it contains the, the water inside the leaf there. But there are these openings on the bottom. And, and I've drawn them on the bottom of the leaf. Most leaves have them on the bottom. There's some plants that have them on the top and the bottom, but this is most common here. And these little openings are called stomata. It's Latin for mouth, and there, there are little openings in the leaf because there does have to be gas exchange with the leaf. Basically, we need to get, well, I'll, I'll tell you, what, I'll, I'll draw that in a second, but that's something that's on the epidermis. Oh, yeah, I wanted to just, these are little, you know, this is just made up of living cells here. We could draw some little nuclei in these epidermal cells, little cells that surround the stomata. All right, now inside the leaf are the cells that do most of the photosynthesis. And again, I'm gonna, I'll show you a real micro, uh, micrograph picture of this in a second, but there's these big sort of juicy cells inside the leaf. These are called mesophyll cells. And this is really where most of the photosynthetic activity in this leaf is taking place. And then the other thing is that in a typical leaf, there's also a lot of air inside the leaf. So there is actually air space here inside the leaf. I'll show you a picture in just a moment, okay? Um, so what's happening is, let's say the sun is shining here on this leaf, a lot of photosynthesis is happening. Um, so there has to be gas exchange. We need to get oxygen out of the leaf, the oxygen that's produced during photosynthesis. And of course we need to get more CO2 into the leaf, right, because we're, we're consuming the CO2 that in that air space as we make glucose. And so we have to have that gas exchange. But when you've got those stomata open so gas exchange can happen, you're also gonna lose water. So water is going to leave the surface of these cells and it's gonna be lost to the environment. And that's a process called transpiration. Let me write that in here, so. Sorry, kinda. 
had to <laughs> squeeze that in there. But the loss of water is, is transpiration. All right. And that actually accounts for a very significant loss of water for the, the sugar that's made. Okay. Wait, I see people still drawing here. So let me, uh, anybody have any questions? Anything I can clarify before we move on here? So people finish up their drawings. All right. So let's look at some pictures of this, right? So here's a cross section of a leaf. You can see the, the epidermal cells up here on the top and the bottom. Here's one of those stomata right here. Um, there's usually a bunch of those on the leaf, but then you can also see there's this airspace inside the leaf. And so most of what's around that is from mesophyll cells. So they're surrounded by this, this, uh, this airspace inside the leaf. Now, if we were to like fly over the top of this leaf and look down on one of those uh, stomata, here's what we would see. So this is a, a micrograph of the stomata. There's two cells that, that flank it called guard cells. And they're really neat cells because they can change their shape and they can actually control the opening of the stomata. So depending on, on what these cells are doing, the stomata could be open, allowing gas exchange, or it could be closed, preventing gas exchange. So those are some of the important features there. All right. So how significant is this water loss? You know, think about a gram of plant tissue. So there on my picture, I just have one gram of, I think this was like dried basil from my kitchen, right? So it's mostly, what that is, dried plant tissue is mostly cellulose, right? That's what my table is up here. A lot of you are, are wearing cellulose right now if you're wearing cotton garments. To make one gram of cellulose, the plant loses about 400 milliliters of water to the environment. So the other number, you see sometimes is it's like over 800 molecules of water gets lost for every one carbon dioxide that gets fixed. So the plant is losing a lot of water to the environment, right? And this is, so far all we've talked about is a C3 plant. And in a second, we're going to see some plants that have, have managed to, to, to evolve some solutions to these problems, all right? But there's significant water loss. Now, there's a, a simple solution to this, though, which is let's shut the stomata. Let's just close the stomata, right? Then you've got this waxy layer on the epidermis. And if the stomata are closed, then you're going to limit water loss. But if you do that, that creates the second problem of photosynthesis. So now we're going to think about that one here. And oh, yeah, sorry. So we got another learning catalytics question that you can log on to. And this is probably going to be pretty typical that we have like learning catalytics. Oh, shoot, I logged out again. I got to work on my <laughs> um you can read read over the question here and think about your answer while i get us logged back in here Okay, so this question is now active there, so you can answer on learning catalytics if you want to. Again, this is kind of good practice for everybody to, to practice kind of jumping on and on learning catalytics, which we'll probably be doing, you know, through the uh, thing. Yeah, question. Oh, yeah, good. The question is how many molecules of water were lost per CO2? It's, a, it's between 800 and 900 is the, the numbers that you see quoted on that. So, all right. So I've given you some time to think about this. Let's see how we're, I'm kind of curious too, just to see how rapidly people are able to log in for it. Okay, good. Looks like we have most of you logged in. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Right, if you don't have learning catalytics, go ahead and put your hand up with the answer that you like the best for this one. How is that, the conditions inside that airspace gonna change uh, if the stomata are closed? All right, go ahead and, Vote for what you like if you're, you know, the answer goes good. Okay, good. Good. I see a lot of this going up. This is the best answer, right? So CO2 is going to decrease, oxygen is going to increase. If we're not allowing gas to change with the environment, right? We're selectively pulling carbon dioxide out of that air and making it into glucose. Meanwhile, we're manufacturing oxygen and releasing that into that airspace. Okay. So that leads us to this next question here. So we're back to this. And um, hang on just a second. Okay, good. I think this one is running now. 
So here's the next one. So I've modified this a little bit here. An enzyme in a plant cell can catalyze two distinct reactions, one using reactant A. And now I'm telling you, reactant A is carbon dioxide. And one using reactant B, which I'm now telling you is oxygen. So those are two of the substrates that this enzyme can use. And so now the affinity, like we said before, I, didn't, I took the number off, but the affinity for A is higher than the affinity for reactant B. So under what conditions will the synthesis of product B be favored? All right, so you have another set of answer choices here. Uh, again, you can select all that apply. So go ahead and think about this and talk with somebody around you if you feel like it or, or, uh, or, or write it down in your notebook if that's more your style. So um, what do you think about this? So our enzyme is able to use carbon dioxide or oxygen. It's got a higher affinity for carbon dioxide. So under what conditions would Oh, a uh, question, yeah. Oh, okay, maybe I'm not. Hmm. I tried delivering it again, you should, yes. Some people are logged in on it. Is it not? No, that's the old question. You have the old question, okay. Oh yeah, right. Hold on. That's my fault. All right. Thank you. I'm working out some kinks here too. Now it should be up there. Thank you for letting me know. So now you should have access to this. All right, overall looking at learning catalytics looks pretty good. Again, so we've got three possible answer choices. So if you don't have learning catalytics today, show me a number one, number two, number three. How many of these would you select if you were uh, to select any number of them? I assume ones, a few twos, mostly ones. Yeah, okay, so some people did go for number number two there. I, I think the only, the, the only uh, so C here is the only, um, is the best answer for this question. Now, you could ask for more information on this, like, oh, well, exactly what is the difference in affinity between CO2 and oxygen for this particular enzyme? You know, you could ask a question like that, too. But when you think about it, right, so you know the affinity for CO2 is higher. Um, I mean, you also might ask, oh, what is the relative concentrations of oxygen and CO2 in the, ap in the atmosphere? That would be a question that might inform your choice on this as well. But based on your answer to this last one here, right, once those stomata are closed, CO2 levels are going to start to drop in the, the leaf and in the leaf airspace and oxygen levels are going to increase. And even though there's a higher affinity for this enzyme for CO2, eventually we're going to get to that point where it starts using more oxygen than CO2 if it can use, use both of them. So really, I think C is the best answer here that um, the stomata have to be closed for a few hours. So this is the second problem the second challenge of photosynthesis, right? So we already talked about the first one, it's water loss. The second is something called photorespiration. And by the way, I didn't name the enzyme, but it's the enzyme we've been talking about already. It's the Rubisco enzyme. So Rubisco can use carbon dioxide as a substrate or oxygen, and it has a higher affinity for CO2. But when oxygen levels are very high, it will start using oxygen as a substrate instead of carbon dioxide. So photorespiration, this happens when Rubisco uh, uses oxygen as a substrate. And I'm just gonna write this here, but we'll, we'll, we'll diagram this in a second. The ultimate result of this happening is that the plant is going to lose carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So the plant loses CO2 to the environment. 
And there's also a, an ATP cost to this, ATP used. So it's going to use up ATP and it's going to lose. I mean, think about it. photosynthesis is all about fixing carbon, right? Taking that carbon in from the environment and making it part of these high energy molecules like a glucose. This is sort of undoing that, right? So it's getting CO2 off into the environment. Now, I just here, just think about this for a moment. This is called photorespiration. Either, you know, think this through yourself or say it out loud to somebody next to you. What, why is respiration a, a good term to use for this based on the limited information I've given you so far? Why is, uh, you know, calling this respiration uh, a, a, a reasonable name for this? Oh, are you answering or are you? Oh, hold, hold up. Everybody think about it for a second. So why, what, why, would, why would plant biologists refer to this as respiration? <laughs> All right. So anybody want to share what you were thinking about? I want, sorry, I want to hear from somebody, somebody new. Um, rest, why, why call this respiration? Why does that make sense based on what you know about it so far? Definitely, no, let's see here. Uh, yeah, go, uh, go ahead over here. Yeah. Plants start taking in one gas and exuding another. Taking in one gas and exuding another. I would say that photosynthesis, you could do that same thing. For that, you want to add to it? Right. I'm sure that wasn't what you were thinking, right? But, but yeah, so in our respiration, right, we take in oxygen and we release CO2 as a waste product. And essentially, these plants are doing the same thing, right? They're taking in oxygen and they're giving off CO2. So calling it respiration kind of makes sense. All right, so let's get back to this. So, um, now you're going to have to jump back in your worksheets a little bit here, but remember we have uh, already filled in some information on this here. We have Rubisco, that enzyme that's so important for, for the Calvin cycle. And so now here's another possible pathway that can be run here. So we start with the same RUBP, the ribulose bisphosphate, and that gets combined with oxygen instead. So an oxygen is going to be added onto that ribulose bisphosphate, and that's going to give us a different num molecule. We don't need to name it, but it's going to be a, a five carbon molecule, right? We're not adding any carbons to it. So we have this five carbon molecule. And then the plant has to work in a whole bunch of steps to regenerate. Just like with the Calvin cycle, we have to regenerate. Uh, we have to regenerate that ribulose bisphosphate. And that is actually a very long and painful process. And so I'm not going to be real careful about this here. But during this regeneration process, uh, CO2 is lost and ATP is used. And also some other energy rich molecules like NADH that you're familiar with from, from aerobic respiration. That's also used in this process too. But, but CO2 is lost and ATP is used up in this reaction. Photo respiration. Okay. So this is interesting, right? So this, this enzyme, this really important enzyme, Rubisco, it can use carbon dioxide as a substrate to do this, you know, what we would broadly describe as a productive uh, uh, pathway. And then it could also catalyze this other pathway when oxygen levels are higher that we could characterize as sort of undoing a lot of the work of photosynthesis, right? So we're, we're releasing CO2 to the environment and we're, we're using up uh, ATP. Um, sorry, I, I know I'm relying on this image a lot that you don't have in your worksheets. This is a great example of something that I'll post like on our daily lecture guide. So when you go after this lecture, when you go to the photosynthesis page, you'll have all of my notes on there, but maybe I'll make a special section with just the images related to this so you can access them. So here, like I said, this is CO2 up here. This is oxygen. And there's another, uh, you know, RUBP, the rib ribulose bisphosphate. That's another reactant for this. And the enzyme is our old friend Rubisco. And, you know, what we have here is product A is glucose. Oops. 
eventually, right, is going to lead to glucose. And product B here is, you know, is going to lead to CO2 loss to the environment. Yeah, question. So just, I mean, I mean it like the same way. I mean, but biochemically, it's totally different than what your cells are doing right now. But, you know, you are taking an oxygen and your cells are creating CO2 as a waste product. And then that gets into your blood and then it goes into the air in your lungs and you exhale it to the environment. Essentially what's happening here is that, you know, to, to reclaim, right? So if you, don't re, if you don't make the ribulose bisphosphate again, you have to regenerate that ribulose bisphosphate. Um, if you don't do that, then the Calvin cycle stops completely. We don't want that to happen. And even though it's hard to see in this diagram, I'll show you a fancier diagram in a second, but one of the, one of the molecules that is created in the process of regenerating the ribulose bisphosphate is carbon dioxide. And that is going to diffuse out of the cells. It's going to get into the airspace inside the leaf and it's going to be lost to the environment. So that's what I mean by that. Good question though. I'm really glad you asked. Any other questions, anything else I can clarify? Here's the whole pathway. So like, I wanted to show you this, not just to blow your mind a little bit, right? So over here in the corner, here's the Calvin cycle, right? So here's Calvin cycle and here's ribulose bisphosphate and here's carbon dioxide or oxygen, right? So these are the two, so, so that's the reaction catalyzed by, by, um, uh, by Rubisco. So again, if you, if you do CO2, then you're just gonna do the Calvin cycle right here and off to the side. You know, we can see we're making, you know, glucose and we're making starch, you know, doing all those things that the plant probably wants to do. All of this other stuff, this is the photorespiration pathway. And you, the plant is going through a lot of trouble to regenerate the ribulose bisphosphate. If we look at this carefully here, we can see here's a spot where this carbon dioxide is given off and that's going to be lost to the environment. Here's a place where NADH is, is uh, or actually, no, that's not a spot. There, but, you know, if we look through here, we can find all places where energy is being used and CO2 is being lost all just to undo that, you know, that thing that Rubisco did, which was grab an oxygen out of the environment and attach it to ribulose bisphosphate. So it's a lot of work for the plant to do this. All right. So why? Why does the plant do this, right? It, again, when you thought everything you probably learned about enzymes in the past, the suggestion that they are very specific to their substrates. Right, high specificity of the enzyme to the substrate. So why is it that Rubisco, this really important enzyme, has this kind of low, uh, you know, it, this, it's non-specific, right? If you use carbon dioxide, or if there's a whole lot of oxygen around, it'll use oxygen, right? It's non-specific. So why is that? And to answer that question, we have to think a little bit about the history of, of Earth and the evolution of photosynthesis. So here um, is a, a graph where we're going back 4 billion years to like the early earth atmosphere. And back then we had very low levels of oxygen. So on my, my solid line here is going to represent oxygen levels, which in the early earth atmosphere was very, very rare. And then somewhere between three, two and three billion years ago, uh, photosynthesis evolved. So organisms evolved that had these enzymes that allowed them to do photosynthesis. Photosynth evolves. Right about here. So then what's going to happen to oxygen? And that includes Rubisco too, right? So the Rubisco enzyme also evolved around that time. So what's going to happen with oxygen levels? Well, oxygen levels start going up. Right? Because these photosynthetic organisms are now pumping out oxygen. So oxygen levels go up. They reach their maximum of around 30% of the atmosphere was oxygen uh, around 500 million years ago. And then it sort of dropped down to here, where today we're at about 20% oxygen in the air around us. There's a bug on this graph. Um, and that's because you might know that there was a time when there were really enormous insects. You're going to learn about insects and how they, uh, you know, their, their uh, circulatory system and their respiration and how they get oxygen in and out of their bodies. Um, and, you know, that time when oxygen levels peak, that's where you had the opportunity to have really large insects. And you'll hear more about that later. Okay. But the important thing is when Rubisco evolved, 
oxygen levels were really, really low. So it didn't evolve specificity not to use oxygen, right? Because oxygen wasn't a big factor in the atmosphere. Now let's let's draw the same, let's draw the adds two under this graph here. I'm gonna start you off. Here's CO2 levels. Don't draw anything in, but just imagine what is this CO2 line? What is the what is the CO2 line gonna look like? Uh, sorry, Bobby, I just I just bapped the cord back here. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, what's the CO2 line going to look like? Go ahead and draw, you know, share your drawing with somebody next to you. If you feel like it, share it with your notebook, whatever your style is. Uh, what's CO2 going to look like? I'm going to start drawing this in. So CO2, of course, when photosynthesis evolves, CO2 levels are going to start going down because now we have all these organisms that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and using it to build their own bodies. And CO2 levels actually got really, really low and are still, relative, compared to oxygen, really very low. Um, you know, we do need, as we get to today, right, we need to draw a little uptick on this, right, because human activity, what, we're, what humans have gotten really good at it's finding all those ancient plants, you know, mostly ancient plants that have been, you know, taken in a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We like to dig those up and we like to burn them to power our lifestyles, right? Our cars and our industry and our devices and everything like that. And so, yes, CO2 levels are increasing, but they're really, I mean, it's sometimes people are surprised to learn that, you know, the CO2 in the atmosphere today just makes up 0.05%. But of course, that, that <laughs> has a really, really significant impact on the climate. Um, CO2 levels, like, er, like this is sort of an interesting, like just from the history of the uh, evolution of life, it's really interesting to think that when life first evolved, CO2 levels were really, really high, right? Which means a lot of heat was trapped in the, uh, in our atmosphere, by our atmosphere, and um, a lot more than would be today. And that was really important because back then, like four billion years ago, our, the sun was a lot weaker than it is today. It's putting out less energy, less heat, and like the you know the early oceans and things like that. Actually, it would have been cold enough that they would have frozen uh, based on the sun's energy if we didn't have at that point during the evolution of life a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere to trap heat in. Now the sun's a lot warmer, and so we need to like reduce our CO2 emissions so that we don't uh, end up warming up the climate. So that little uptick there at the end due to human activity is something we need to be very concerned about. But the point here for our lecture is that when, CO, when photosynthesis evolved, when Rubisco evolved, CO2 levels were really, really high and oxygen levels were really, really low. And there was no selective pressure to evolve. You know, to, there wasn't a selective pressure to, to evolve the specificity of just using CO2 because oxygen just wasn't a factor. But now when you look at plants today, right here, um, oxygen levels are quite a bit higher than CO2 levels. And even though uh, plants, the, the rubisco does have a higher affinity for CO2, it still is, it uses oxygen. Now, I don't want to quite leave you with the message here that like photorespiration is just a disaster for plants. It's just like, like you, know, you might make a prediction based on what I've told you here, that like if you took a plant and you put it in a chamber where there was zero oxygen and just 100% CO2 in that chamber, you would think that plant would be really happy, right? Because it's not going to do any of this sort of wasteful photorespiration that I've been talking about. But in fact, actually, those plants do have a little bit of a problem. Like plants have to do some of these. There are some molecules over here in the photorespiration pathway, which actually are important for the plant to be healthy, right? Doesn't need a lot of them. So I think like for the purposes of this class, it's okay for you to think, you know, that photorespiration, what it does is it undoes the work of photosynthesis. That's okay. You can, if you focus on that, you'll be fine for bio-162. But I just want to say, to be honest, that plants do some of the things that are made during photorespiration are actually important metabolic products for plants. And the plant that's grown in pure CO2 and does zero photorespiration, it's actually a little less healthy because it's missing some stuff. So I just wanted to say that for, for accuracy. Um, anyway, okay, good. So I should stop and see if anybody has any questions or anything I can clarify here. Right. Okay. So what are what are plants to do? Right. You could you got these two challenges. You want you got to do photosynthesis, right? So you got 
You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You're either gonna you know, keep the stomata open, then you're gonna get lots of gas exchange, but you're gonna lose a lot of water to the environment. If you close the stomata, you're gonna prevent the water from being lost, but you are going to then create inside the leaf those conditions where this you know, kind of wasteful, you know, this process of photorespiration that undoes photosynthesis is going to happen, right? And so this is like most plants on Earth. When you walk out of this room today, you're going to see some plants, presumably, and most of those plants are dealing with these challenges right now. Um, this is a good stopping point for us because what we're going to think about next time is two solutions that have evolved 